Здравствуйте, дорогие друзья. Меня зовут Сергей Качкин. Я режиссер документального кино. В феврале 2020 года я был на фестивале русской культуры в Англии, в Манчестере. По дороге в Лондон я заехал в Оксфорд, где был также показан один из моих фильмов. И там мне повезло, я познакомился с Николаем Дмитриевичем Толстым. Николай Дмитриевич – писатель, историк. Он любезно пригласил меня к себе в гости, где мы записали почти часовое интервью. Собственно, это интервью я и хотел бы предложить э, вашему вниманию сейчас. Очень надеюсь, что э, наш разговор будет вам столь же интересен, как это было нам. Поехали. Николай Дмитриевич, здравствуйте. Здравствуйте. It's, so, it's such a pleasure to hear when you speak Russian. Uh -huh. Could you please introduce yourself as long, as briefly as you want to, mm -hmm. uh, to people who will watch uh, this video? Yes. Well, my name is Nikolai Dmitrich Tolstoy Miroslavsky, uh, but in England it's easier to say Tolstoy. Um, my father escaped from Russia after, during the revolution in 1920, and he was only a boy, but he was smuggled out of Russia by his brave English nanny and brought back to England. And I, so I was brought up in England, but my father uh, remarried when I was about um, six, I think. And uh, my stepmother was also a Russian emigre. So I was brought up in a Russian speaking household. And we even had uh, a gardener and his wife who couldn't speak English. And even this was, I can remember in then about 19, 48 or 9, he still addressed my father, and he was a Soviet um, emigrant, he addressed my father as Baron, <laughs> uh, quite in a quite perfectly natural way. And, and of course, we went to the Russian church, and, um, and in those days, though the Russian emigration was nothing like in Britain what it was in Paris, nevertheless, um, there was a, quite a lot of people there, and they all had fascinating uh, personal histories, uh, and I don't know why, but from a very early age, I just loved history, so I loved to hear these stories. I had an uncle who fought under Dienikin, mm. and, um, and he was the last Estonian minister when Estonia became independent in Britain. I remember there was a, a former policeman, Garadaboy, in church. He had a huge moustache like this, and we all, he had, um, in 1905, he arrested Voroshilov in, oh. in a riot. And there were so many people like, oh yes, there, and I met a Swedish Baron Palmstierner who tried to stop Lenin from crossing Sweden in 1917. So history was alive for me. I could meet all these people and I felt very strongly for the whites, obviously, and st I still do. And. And then because, of, perhaps partly because of my background, I loved history because I felt in a funny way a sort of our family as part of history. But also my love of history made me interested in, in Russia, my back, family background. And so many of the books I've written have been about Russian history. I also wrote a history of my family uh, since when they first arrived in Russia in 1353. And uh, now, and I've lived to see the end of the Soviet Union, and uh, my books were uh, um, some, I think, yes, Zhirbi uh, Yalti was published in Russia, and I had great support, among others, from Solzhenitsyn, who has um, uh, uh, arranged for the books to be published in Russia. So, but at the same time, I'm also English by birth and half English by descent, and, and I love English history too, it fascinates me. But I suppose looking around me, all history does. Yeah, yeah as you mentioned, yeah. could you please describe where we are? Um, I don't know, as colorful or as magnificent you would like to, just, um, you know, um, to intrigue people who are watching this video. Well, we've lived in this house. The house itself is, um, was built in 1620. And, but we've lived here 40 years, and um, this was a wagon shed where the, uh, uh, in the old days they kept the wagon. So I turned it into a library, and as you can see, my books 
keep coming in and it's now beginning to become difficult to find room for new books, but they still keep, I keep, still keep buying them. And I love it and I feel, you know, just by looking around me, I'm, ab I'm absorbing what's in the books, yet though of course I'm constantly reading and working from them. And I think, well, it was the Scottish um, uh, writer Thomas Carlyle who said that uh, uh, the best university is your own library. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, for me, I totally understand you, and you know, it's it's fascinating what you can see here. <laughs> um, um, you just mentioned that um, you grew up. You were you were born in England. You grew up here, but uh, you're distant, uh, halfly Russian. And then you've got a stepmother; she was Russian. For me, when I talk to you and uh, look at you, for me, you you. You're, as a personality, you're the great representative of very interesting mixture of culture, um, English and Russian. Maybe it's too much, uh, too much intimate question, but um, what do you feel inside of you? Uh, uh, is, is it a huge struggle between, or does it happen time to time, or maybe it used to happen, not anymore? I mean, who you are more? <laughs> Well, quite often people ask me this and I even ask myself. I suppose um, when I'm studying <coughs> English history or, or, and Scottish and Welsh and Irish, um, I feel English, but then at the moment I'm just finishing a book about Russian history, then I feel Russian. And I think I feel, anyway, if you have a family heritage, I'm and at the present the head of the Tolstoy family, of the senior branch. So I must, uh, I feel Russian, I have a Russian passport and a British passport. So I'm a sort of mixture and I slip between one and the other without being easily able to say which I am. But um, certainly my sympathies lie with Russia. And do you remember, I mean, was it all the time or you uh, maybe it became for you clear when you became maybe 16, 17, or it was since the very beginning? It was from the beginning because, and when I was little, I was completely bilingual in Russian and English. Um, but my spoken Russian um, deteriorated because I went to English boarding school where of course no one spoke Russian and um, only at home that I spoke Russian. Um, uh, and again, I was at university in Ireland so, um, but nevertheless, I, I never, it was there with me from the beginning and I never forgot it really. And anyway, with a name like mine, you can't really forget. And that's true, that's true. As soon as we touch the subject of Russian citizenship, uh, British citizenship, um, doesn't happen you often visit Russia in our days? And if yes, could you please tell some details? I, at first, of course, right. In a way, the Soviet Union was a sort of forbidden territory. Um, but in 1968, I, I went for the very first time. And I'm glad I went because um, I, even now I can make a sort of comparisons with the Soviet Union, what I see when I go to Russia now. But after the fall of communism, then I began to go a lot. Well, one reason was because the books, I've written books about um, 20th century Russian history and um, I wanted to see the archives which were beginning to be released and President Yeltsin, though I never met him, was a good friend to me because he, uh, I think under Solzhenitsyn's influence, he personally said that I was to be allowed access to all the secret archives concerning what I was writing about. So a lot of my work I went over there for this research. Um, since then, I did I do less research because I've I've already done it, and I have all copies of the records. But uh, 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 among our family, we have every second year um, a family reunion at Yasna Polyana, and there I go, and we have some cousins who live in Russia. Uh, some I have uncle, cousins in Denmark. We're scattered because of the emigration in Paris and America. 
uh, and I love going there because in a way I feel that it's my home and the Russian spirit doesn't change really. And so I have many friends and relations there. And not long ago, I went to Kazan, which is where my family came from. And my um, great grandfather was Marshal of the Nobility of Kazan. And we married, also, we married into Tatar families, uh, like uh, Chegodayev, mm -hmm. uh, because we, they were neighbors of ours. So um, I think I have Tatar blood as well. But if so, I'm very proud of that. If you allow me, I will jump a little bit in, to make it a little bit easy, um, more interesting, let's say, intriguing, um, uh, jumping um, in time we are talking about. Um, uh, I w right, at the right moment, I would like to jump a little bit back to your youth time. Could you please tell about yourself um, which school you have been going to, then maybe a college or university, just a little bit more about your background, studying background, and then how you got the idea that you are, uh, sh um, you are focused on history only. Yes, well, I was, um, uh, I was, but my father was fortunate because many were emigre Russians, of course, probably majority were very poor. And you know, hear of princes and generals driving taxis in Paris. But my father was never badly off because his mother was English, though she died in Russia in 1916 when he was only a little boy. Um, her family was a wealthy family in England. So when he came here, he could go to good schools. And then he himself became a, a well-known uh, barrister in England. So I went to um, private schools, uh, which I was very where I was very happy. I went to, where my father went to Wellington College, which was a very, or was then a very military college. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, then I went in the army and was being trained as an officer, but I then got a, a severe back injury mm. and I had to leave the army. And the back injury troubled me a lot of my life, but actually a year ago I had an operation mm. which was successful. Then I went to, University in Dublin, and I particularly loved that. I liked the Ireland very much and the Irish. I became very interested in Irish history, which I still still retain great interest in it. And um, after that, I taught for about 10 years in schools, but, and I like it because I like children and I like teaching. But then when I married my wife, Georgina, we she... I got a contract to write. I'd already written two books and then uh, I published them. And then I was asked to write another book. And I said to Georgina, my wife, look, we'll, we'll give up teaching and I'll, um, I'm just going to write books. And uh, she was a very, and always has been, a very supportive friend and ally as well as wife because she never questioned this. But the advance payment for the book I was commissioned to write was 76 pounds. I think, yes, and um, of course, we, I don't know how long you could live on that, but somehow, like most writers, I suppose, I felt that was all I had to do, and we had big struggles at times. We never knew if we would be able to, what would happen in the next year. Sometimes I had good luck and got a very good contract. Sometimes it was difficult. And then, of course, in my later life, I had big political difficulties because though people think of England as the country of the free, it is in many respects, but it hasn't always been for me because a book in particular and then a subject I was studying and publishing uh, angered the British government and um, very severe measures were taken to try to stop me writing altogether. And many people will think oh, well, that couldn't surely happen in Britain, but actually my experience, I'm afraid, has been very, uh, very bad in that respect. It, in a way, because studying Russian history, I could see parallels with the political censorship. And in some respects, now, I'm more free to say and write what I think in Russia than I am here in Britain. For example, the book I'm writing, uh, I'm already now hardened to these things. It's a book about which will cause great offence to the British government. And um, I know what will happen. There will be... Uh, newspapers will refuse to review it. Others will publish reviews 
pretending that I've said this, that, or other, which I didn't say. But I think, after all, this is what my famous relative, Lev Nikolaevich, to some extent experienced with the censorship in Russia, Imperial Russia, and so you just have to fight against it, and, and I will. And I have many allies in Britain anyway. Great. It's, it's very good that you slightly uh, talked about this subject and we will definitely uh, talk about it in, in details. For me personally, it's very important to talk to you and that I, I'm very much thankful that you could find some time to meet me in person and to record this video. But some people, I definitely sure they will say, ah, oh, you're a Russian, but let's go to live to Russia and um, to live in our conditions. I know maybe you don't want to spend your time, but please, could you give a few words to this kind of people? Definitely yes. they will watch. It's a, uh, I understand what you're saying, and, uh, and I think it, it would be a fair question. You mean, uh, why don't I go and live in Russia if I think it's... Well, uh, I think if I'd been younger and the fall of communism had happened then, uh, and before I was married, I think I, I would have gone to live in Russia because there was nothing to stop me. I was... Didn't, I was independent person. But now, well, I suppose the decisive thing is that my family is here. I don't know if my wife would want, she loves going to Russia, but I don't know if, she can't speak Russian, I don't know if she'd like it. And But I would miss my children and grandchildren. So even though they feel Russian too, and in some of them, my, uh, they all speak Russian. My do eldest daughter completely fluently, Alexandra, and the others in some degree or other, and three of our grandchildren, um, I think Russian is their first language. So we remain Russian, but they all live here. So for that reason and that reason, really only, I think, I, I, I couldn't now go and live in Russia permanently. For me, it's absolutely understandable. It's just... Um, it's, just a, yeah, it's a reasonable question, yes. But I don't... Um, uh, say that uh, things in Britain are better or worse than Russia generally. I only speak from my own experience that I am punished for what I write in a way which um, George Orwell would have understood and which is done in a peculiarly British way. No one sends me to a gulag and no one sends someone to poison me. But nevertheless, they have their own British ways of doing things. And I'm sorry to say that even the British judges in this instance, again, I don't say generally, which is probably not the case, that they were corrupt. And um, we discovered evidence of that. Well, for a start, the judge who heard the legal action against me to stop me producing my books, he lived only eight miles away from the man who was accusing me in court. And uh, they turned out they knew each other well, they belonged to the same private golf club. And the judge, one after the other, just dismissed evidence as if it didn't exist. But actually, in my coming book, which they will hate, because the evidence which I acquired in the Russian archives, thanks to President Yeltsin, is so devastating to the, what the British have been saying about me that they, will, they won't really know which way to turn or to look. Um, but that's their business, not mine. I should say you're a fearless person. Well, I don't like, I hate bullies. I suppose that's why I don't like communism. That's why <laughs> I don't like corrupt judges and, and corrupt uh, newspaper editors. There are not so many of them, but some. So, first of all, in order to, to make a short introduction, could you please uh, tell how it happened that you, you learn about this case you are talking about in your books? Yes. And which but... way, which, which I don't know which circumstances. It, that is an interesting question to me because, uh, of course, being brought up in the Russian emigration, I heard stories of people being sent back by force after the last war. Um, and I just thought of it as some isolated incidents, I think, as far as I remember. But the first time I actually heard from an eyewitness was not from a Russian, but from a British person. And this was, it was interesting circumstances because when... In 1956, Bulgarin and Khrushchev came to England on a state visit. <clears throat> I was very angry, and so were most of the emigre Russians, because after all, though Khrushchev wasn't as bad as Stalin, he was still had blood on his hands. And um, I had a lot of Polish friends too, who felt very strongly. 
And so when I read in the newspaper that Bulganin and Khrushchev were arriving at Victoria Station and were to be greeted by the Prime Minister, Anthony Eden, I was so cross that I went, I was only 19, I went to the station and I had a bat poster someone gave me, I think my Polish friends, which said, keep the red beasts out. <laughs> and I saw Khrushchev, I was about 100 yards away, I saw Khrushchev and Bulganin come out, Eden was embracing the, them. So I held up my poster and from behind me, someone leapt up and ripped it out of my hand. And I looked round and there were three, they weren't very well dressed looking people. I thought they were communists. So um, I was young and, and I punched one on the face. And uh, then they uh, seized hold of me and took me away. And it turned out anyway, that they were British police. Mm. And they were terrified that anyone, well, uh, that anyone should, it was only a peaceful objection, but you see, this was the first time I came up against British um, censorship. And they, I was taken in a, um, 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 what they call a black Mariah, a black van, to a police cell. And in the police cell, um, after a bit, a nice police sergeant came in to give me some supper, bacon and eggs, and he started talking to me. And he said, why are you so upset about this? And I said, well, I think it's a disgrace that they should, for a start, that they should be received by the Queen. And he said, oh, well, I agree with you on that. And then he, he said, um, and I said, well, and also, I think I must have mentioned about people, Russians being sent back to be killed by Stalin in 1945. And he said, oh, well, that's funny you should say that because, and this was after all only 11 years later, he said, I was in the army in Austria in 1945, and we had to put these Russians on trains to go back to the Soviet Union. And um, uh, some of them were jumping out of the trains and purposely falling and breaking their necks. And he said, we couldn't understand it. We just wanted to get back to England and our homes. And these people were committing suicide. And that was the very first person who actually witnessed it. And that always remained in my mind. So then some years later, quite a few years later, the British government began releasing documents um, under a new rule which said after 30 years they could be released. So this was about 19, it must have been 1973, I think, because they went up to the end of the war. And a friend of mine, I remained interested, and a couple of friends of mine, one was a Ukrainian friend, said, let's look into this. And we, I went to the archives and I saw, compared with what I now know, it was very little, but even so, I saw that this was an extraordinary story, that the numbers of people who were sent back, altogether the British and Americans sent about one, uh, two million, uh, two and a quarter million people were sent back to be either murdered or most of them slaves in the Gulag. And this was a war crime which nobody knew about it, even knew it existed. So I thought, well, I, I shall now try and make this public. And, uh, but it became, a, it took me many, many years. Even now, I'm still, my new book is going back to this because of the new evidence. And um, I went, but my, I thought, one thing I must do is speak to as many people as I possibly can who experienced this. Of course, I couldn't interview the people who went back to the Soviet Union, but quite a few escaped, and I came to know them, and then one would tell me about another. But I also was in a very good position to research this because of being to the English. I went to the military school. I was in the British Army. I was at Sandhurst. I speak English, obviously, like an English person. So I could speak to the English officers and generals, and they would trust me, but... I, at the same time, I could also speak to the poor Russian refugees, and they knew my family background, so they trusted me. And I think if I'd just been an Englishman, however skillful, I wouldn't have had those advantages. So they spoke to me on tape recording, very frankly, and eventually I published the book called um, Victims of Yalta, because it was the Yalta Treaty, the agreement was made. And... Um, uh, the book was actually very well received, but I gradually began to discover more as a result of the book coming out, more people spoke to me, more evidence came out. And I then began to accuse the people who were chiefly responsible for the, especially for the secret agreement where they handed back people 
like my father or even myself who were not Soviet citizens. And I, it seemed to me the evidence suggested that this was a deliberate plot, not an accident. People said, oh, they couldn't, how could English people distinguish between one Russian and another, white or red? Anyway, I was right, um, because the new evidence I have uh, out of the R Russian archives has shown that I was right. And um, I'm just in the last throes of finishing my late new book on the subject. I know people out there who might, they may hear or know, I'm sure the British government knows what I'm doing. But luckily, thanks to computers and so on, I have copies, so many copies that they couldn't destroy my evidence or my book. I remember when I went to Russia, I didn't meet President Yeltsin, but it was he who, um, and I'm more grateful to him, who ordered all the archives to be opened. And I went to see the man who was in charge of all the archives, General Dmitry Volkogonov. Mm. Uh, and he, he had published a very good biography of Stalin and Lenin and Trotsky. He told me about the archives. And then he put, said at one point, how come the British don't understand what everyone in Russia knows is true? And uh, I, I was glad to hear that. And it's, tr it's true that uh, my books were, were not censored in Russia, but they, they were, or one of them was censored in England. As far as I know, it's also a quite complicated situation with publishing the book. But could you please clar clarify? Even for me, I, when I, I read a few times and still some information is missing. So you wrote the book, then you wrote... Uh, it's not a, even uh, a book, it's yes. a kind of a booklet. Could you please uh, clarify this? Name a book and then uh, this booklet, because it's really not easy to get into the details, because uh, especially for the person who never heard about that. Exactly. Well, the first book, as I say, generally received public acclaim and, and people, and um, indeed, <coughs> at a public subscription, a monument was elected, er, erected to the victims of Yalta, which is still there in, um, opposite the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. So generally the sympathy was with me. Very few people could possibly want to defend the policy. But then I began to find more evidence of who was directly responsible for the worst aspects. And they were the former Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, who was at the time minister out in the Mediterranean with responsibility for um, also including events in southern Austria. And um, the, ch the chief of staff who gave the actual orders, a man called Brigadier Lowe, but who was made a lord by Macmillan, maybe significantly, uh, maybe not, uh, uh, and, and I accused Lord Aldington in this paper subsequent to the book, as you say, uh, which accused Lord Aldington of being a war criminal. And after all, I can't see that any distinction, and many British officers who were there on the spot agreed with me, between German officers saying, oh, well, I was only obeying orders when they had um, victims murdered, and British officers who did the same thing. Of course, as a historian, I'm not being a judge, so every single person's actions must be judged on that individual basis. Some, some did nothing more than see lorries going past, but others made decisions, in my view, very evil decisions, and also decisions which was, in one respect, worse than the Germans because they actually disobeyed orders because the um, Allied Commander-in-Chief, Field Marshal Alexander, he was a wonderful man, a great Christian and a gentleman, and believed that war is a, ho a horrible business, but nevertheless should be conducted chivalrously and above all in con con um, uh, fulfilling the Geneva Convention, how you treat prisoners of war. He's, his orders that then no one should be sent back um, were disobeyed deliberately and but secretly, and all these poor people were sent back. So I brought this to light. Then Lord Aldington was persuaded uh, against his will to sue me for a libel action for, on the grounds that what I wrote was untrue. And then a big case happened. It caused a huge sensation in Britain at the end of... 1989. Uh, it went on for three months and witnesses came, but the judge was completely hostile 
and virtually instructed the jury to find me guilty and also to give very big damages. He said, don't give Mickey Mouse damages. Well, the jury were, he actually admitted in court that he himself had investigated the background of the jury, which judges are not supposed to do. There'd been some interference. And he, um, uh, and the jury obediently found me guilty and fined me one and a half million pounds, which was three times more than any other case in British legal history. Uh, of course, I couldn't couldn't pay because I didn't have anything like that. Uh, but they thought it would shut me up and, and shut up other people from talking about the, the business. But this just made me angry and I thought I'm not going to give in to these people. They're, they're, they're stupid, but they're also evil. And many English people, I would say even possibly the majority of English people were on my side. And quite a few, um, in the, of the, by quite a bit of, uh, of the press too, but there were others who, of course, tried to say that everything I said was lies. And um, then I became, I had to become bankrupt. They, they tried to, they wanted above all to take away my library because they knew that without that I couldn't write more, or they hoped, and probably I couldn't. Um, and so there was a great battle between, but we had good friends, and some, in some cases, uh, important friends, like Solzhenitsyn, was a great supporter and broadcast on, on, uh, on both on British and on Russian television about this matter. Um, and we, when we had, first of all, a lot of people sent money to support us, but quite soon, of course, that ran out. And then, then the, um, the only country in Europe which refused to hand back any Russians to the Soviets was the smallest country in Europe, Liechtenstein. And the Prince of Liechtenstein had a whole battalion, I think about um, 500 men, who crossed the frontier into Liechtenstein. Liechtenstein, as everyone knows, is a, a tiny country. It had a police force of 12 and no army. But when the Soviets, they actually sent um, people from Smirsch into Liechtenstein to demand that the prince hand over these people to be dealt with. And he and his government just flatly refused. And they weren't sent back. And when I went to interview the prince, who was still alive then, he, I said to him, but, because the prince had big estates in Czechoslovakia and Austria, which are now in Soviet hands, so he, they could actually do him a lot of harm. And also, they were, no one knew in the, <coughs> sorry, the first week of May 1945, how far the Red Army would advance they could have taken over Liechtenstein. And I said, weren't you afraid? And he said, no, I spoke firmly to them, and that's the language they understand. And in my book, I said, if only um, Churchill and uh, Roosevelt could have understood the same thing. Uh, and, um, but anyway, the, 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 the prince, uh, he had died by this time, but his son came forward, he was told by someone that we were having such problems with the British government, and he said, well, I will, my father would want me to, and I will support the Tolstoy family. So for many years, he um, gave us enough money each year to be able to survive and continue the struggle. So, and there were other people who helped in other ways. So somehow we came through that. Then I've written books on other subjects, but, I've been blacklisted, and in Britain these things happen in a very underhand, secretive way. It's not like in the Soviet Union, where you were just removed in the early hours of the morning, though they would love to have done that. Um, and so, that, for instance, my books, they just don't review my books, or, or if they do, very few papers will do it. And my last book, which had nothing whatever to do with this business at all, a biography of my stepfather, that was banned by editors of many newspapers from being reviewed. Those who did review, there were, two, there were good reviews, some magazines, um, so it's not total uh, in, a, in Britain, the, the censorship, but others simply said the main purpose of the review was to say, don't read this book. It's not, it's not, none of it's true, but without saying what it was about. Uh, so, uh, 
but but still, it doesn't deter me because it, it annoys me, but it doesn't deter me because at least when a book is published, the book remains. The people who censored it go off to another world in due course. I can not I won't say which one. And um, uh, and at least it's on the record. And if the, unless these things are published in time, uh, they, they probably will never be published at all. Or in a, anyway, I know so much now about it that really, in a way, perhaps no one else could quite write the same book. So this book will be my last book, I think, on this particular subject. But uh, uh, thanks to President Yeltsin, I'm in a position now to say what really happened. Because before, when I wrote my books, I actually said in the books, one of the troubles and worries of writing a book like this is I'm entirely dependent on British and American archives, principally. But we don't know what's in the Russian archives. We don't know if we'll ever know. But the trial took place in 1989. Of course, it was only a matter of months before the Soviet Union began to collapse. And I was eventually able to see the Russian archives. And of course, what I'd said also in my books is maybe they'll show that I'm completely wrong. Every, not many historians are in this peculiar situation. In fact, they showed I was not only right, but in some cases, it was even worse than what I'd written. So but it's also, as a historian, I have to say, it's very exciting. Um, how many books altogether you, you wrote about this particular subject? Two. Two. Yes. And they, um, we know that uh, they haven't been published or at all in, in English language. Uh, um, or there are some, uh, it's possible to read it in English. Yes, my first book wasn't censored. And uh, that you can easily get um, on, the, on the internet. The second book was um, censored in a very particularly odd British way. When I had the Aldington trial in 1989, the book was not the subject of the libel action. It had nothing to do with it. It was the leaflet that I circulated afterwards. So there was no legitimate way under British law of censoring the second book. But what they did, the lawyers for Lord Aldington circulated a forged document to every library in Britain, university libraries and other libraries, saying that the book, uh, pretending to be a court order, banning the book. And so mo most of them obediently did what they were told. I think in other countries, probably they wouldn't have obeyed, but in Britain, they, many, most of them did. Uh, so the censorship was done in this very peculiarly British way uh, through a, a forged um, court order, which never actually was issued by the court. And then when your book has been translated uh, into Russian, when uh, did it I, I think that would have been about 1983, I'm guessing now from memory. And I was, it was very intriguing because I went over to Russia and, um, and I... My, I had a, a good friend, a former a retired Russian police officer who was helping me, and he, he came to me one morning and he said, Nikolai, the, um, uh, there's the Russian Staff College, I think it was, they, uh, the general there would like to talk to you. So we went to see him and he was very nice. Oh no, he'd found out that the Russian military had published my book without asking my permission. and. Um, he, he, my friend said, yeah, that's what it was. He said, you go to them and they must pay you. Uh, obviously, I didn't object to it's being published. But, um, and I, I said, well, no, I don't really mind about the money. And Russia is in a bad way at the moment anyway. I don't need the money. Um, but I'm very glad they published it. But he said, no, no, we'll go and see him. So we did. And he was a charming gentleman. But everything in Russia was in confusion. And he explained to me that they hadn't got enough money to pay me. I said, I don't mind that at all. But what was very interesting, a few years later, the, um, uh, I was at the opening of the Russian Museum of the Emigration in Moscow, a beautiful museum. And um, a nice looking man in civilian clothes came up to me. He said, you don't know me, uh, but the, he was in charge of the Russian Staff College, yes. And he said to me, he was a general, he said, you might be interested to know that I've made your book compulsory reading at the Russian Staff College. 
And I thought, well, that I never dreamt that one day the book that is banned in Britain would be actually compulsory for the Russian army. Um, so you can see how my Russian, uh, I'm split in half to British and Russian, and how the two um, sort of might get muddled up together. As far as I know, you're one of your daughter, or maybe. By the way, could you please tell how many children do you have? And some of them have uh, has uh, have very strong connect uh, connection uh, to Russian culture, even maybe stronger, or they are involved deeper than you are. Yes. Could you please describe? Well, my eldest daughter Alexandra was married to a, a Russian, um, a Russian Tatar, uh, and uh, and she speaks perfect Russian and goes to Russia a lot and it has broadcast even on Russian television, I think, and she takes people riding in Central Asia. Um, and so she is very, and her children, three children, uh, all, uh, are all author, Pravoslavni, of course, or Orthodox, and um, they all speak Russian perfectly. And my second daughter, Anastasia, she speaks Russian. I wouldn't, I don't think perfectly, but anyway, she speaks well. And Dmitri, our son, speaks well. Only I think our youngest daughter, Ksenia, uh, she doesn't speak Russian. But they all, they're all orthodox and they all feel Russian. And as I say, Alexandra is uh, really more Russian than me. It's interesting that all your children have Russian names. Was it easy uh, to give them na Russian names? Uh, did you have any problem with your wife? No, my wife has been marvellous, because though she's very English, her maiden name was Brown, which you couldn't have a more English name, but she has um, thrown herself into... Um, she hasn't become orthodox, but only because we live in the country and there isn't a Russian church nearby, but she's completely supportive. And throughout all the struggle we have with the British government, not only did she never reproach me and say, you know, you've brought all this trouble on us, she's supported me throughout without ever questioning about it. Well, I mean, she knows all about it because she, she's met all these interesting people. And I thought of a great reward just for a moment on that subject was when she and I were in Moscow one, during one of our visits and Solzhenitsyn asked us to go to see him. And uh, I only say this because it was nice to, that my wife should see it. And he embraced me and said, Moi Giroi. <laughs> And I thought she, she, it was good that she saw that because she, I wouldn't be, well, I don't think I am a Giroi, but uh, at the same time, uh, whatever I've done is, is, would not have happened except for her. And, um, but she is like, there are many English people like her who in different ways, not, like, not as much as her, of course, have supported. I would, would never like it to be thought that the English people were hostile to what I was doing. Um, it's the people in government who have been, in many cases, very corrupt. Well, one of the worst things that happened during our trial was that the British government ordered uh, all the most important documents which are kept in the public record office to be removed and were concealed by the ministries so that we couldn't use them for the defence. And I know this because one of the people in the Ministry of Defence was in charge of this operation and he felt so, it was so disgusting that he actually passed all the secret correspondence and the list of documents over to me and I have them uh, copied here and elsewhere um, so that um, even there at the heart of where the plotting was going on there were well at least one man who sort of thought this was completely wrong. So you were talking about the tr trial, right? Trial. Yes. But uh, what was the end of this? Because you, you mentioned that you uh, you have be uh, you've been obliged to pay one million and a half pounds. It's unbelievable yes. amount. Could you please tell a little bit more in detail? Well, under English law and probably in other countries, um, I became bankrupt. And in English law, if if you if you haven't tried to cheat in any way or hide money, at the end of three years, the bankruptcy comes to an end. But here again, the English judges broke the English law and said that I should go on being bankrupt. 
And in the end, what stopped it was that my lawyers took it to the European Court of Human Rights in um, Strasbourg, and they said this violated my rights as to in a democratic democratic right to freedom of speech. So they were condemned by the European Court of Human Rights, and they had to stop persecuting me. And um, uh, but to end the then we began to take a case against Lord Aldington because we discovered documents which showed that he'd perjured himself, he'd lied during the trial, documents, official British documents at the time. And so then he, uh, my, eventually my lawyer said, to, I had very nice lawyers who acted for nothing, and they said, look, he's not, we think he would give up uh, 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 if, um, if for a very modest sum of money because it's so bad, his reputation is so bad now. And I said, well, I wouldn't give him one penny because I'm not paying a murderer. They said, well, the thing is, he's now spent so much money. If you paid him um, about something like quite a lot, 100,000 pounds, he wouldn't get any of it. It would all go to his lawyers. And you don't want to go on wasting the rest of your life and I thought that was good advice. So, and by, sometimes I think almost as if like a miracle, we didn't have a hundred thousand pounds. And, and my mother died, and I didn't know she even had that, and she had left me a hundred thousand pounds. So I feel bad that my poor mother's money went to this, these terrible people, but even so, um, I had to get on with my life. And also, if I didn't get on with my life, I wouldn't be able to write the book I'm now writing. So it all worked out. Not completely satisfactorily, but better than it might have been. Um, if we talk back about your children, did they ask you about uh, your Russian uh, culture? Maybe they were asked uh, by, uh, in the school, by their schoolmates, um, friends, why they have Russian names. It's interesting for me just personally, it's because it's, it happens not very often when children have Russian names. Yes. So Anastasia maybe, it. yes, Anastasia. Yes. But um, the rest, it's not. Yes, yes. Well, I, Dimitri was named after my father and the girls were named after the, the imperial family whom I, I don't think Nicholas II, obviously he wasn't a good emperor, but the way they died was so appalling that I like think like most Russians and anyway, in our church, they're martyrs. So that's how I look on them and I, and I, I love them really. Um, yes, they, well, I think, um, of course, Tolstoy is such a well-known name, not quite so well-known in England as in other countries, quite often, People in England, are, if I'm buying something, they ask me to spell my name. But I know that no one in France or Germany would ask me to spell my name, they know. But still, uh, they, they knew we were Russian and, um, and they were all went, came with that when we went to the Russian church. Um, uh, Alexandra was married in the Russian church, so was Ksenia. Um, and th th so, They've, they really, they're proud of being Russian, I know, and, um, and I'm glad that they are proud. It's, it's, um, it's interesting uh, because I'm, as a, um, being a part of Soviet, I uh, do still have some uh, difficulties with uh, identifying who I am. And uh, the, the situation you describe, it seems like more easy. Uh, it's, it's, of course, I should ask. Uh, I should talk to your children about that. But yes. it's, uh, the way you describe it, it's, uh, it's probably you were so much convinced that you you were Russian. Yes. Did you? I was because, after all, I was brought up in a completely Russian-speaking household, and I was brought up in a time when there were many Russian emigres who are family friends whom I saw regularly. And um, and I had two very darling great aunts, Marussia and, and Lilia, uh, who were born in I think 1881 and 82. So they would talk to me about life in Imperial Russia, and of course they saw the emperor. My great grandfather was Chamberlain to the last emperor, and uh, so and I have a long tape recording of my aunt Lilia talking about life on our estate in Russia. So all these things were very familiar, as if as if that had happened to me almost. And I, I hope our children 
a lot of this was passed down to them by me and I encouraged them to feel Russian um, and of course very important to be orthodox. Uh, this is exactly what I'm missing as I, as I already mentioned uh, being a partly Soviet but I hope somehow I will get this understanding feeling. Yeah, just um, completing our very intriguing, kind, interesting um, conversation. Do you have any plan to visit Russia? If so, please tell me about that. Also, if you have time to meet any Russian, if anybody who is Russian would like to meet you and talk to you, take your time, waste your time. And um, it's just interesting for me. Um, once again, uh, it's unbelievable that I'm here for me and I talk to you and I'm able to ask you some questions. And, and I wonder if somebody else is um, enough lucky as I am right now <laughs> to talk to you and uh, to speak well, to you. You're very kind. No, no, of course I love, my, of course I have to be careful with my time because it's most important to get my books done. But uh, in general, of course, I love to meet and talk to Russian people. And I'm very, very interested and fascinated by what is happening in Russia. You asked me if I'm going there. I think we will be. It's this year we have again the family reunion at Yasna Poliana. If we do, then I'll definitely go with Georgina. Um, as for and other Russians, I like to meet very much, and occasionally they do come here. And um, if I if I'm not too busy, uh, usually I can spare the time. Uh, then I like to I like to meet them. Well, I like to keep up to date because after all. I only see Russia as an outsider when I when I visit, but uh, but in one respect, I get a sort of snapshot because as I usually go, certainly every other year, but because of the family reunion, <clears throat> so I see differences which have happened in the two years, and I think we meant discussing earlier, and we where we go, for instance, into Tula. And I, I'm very impressed by the changes I see, that far more shops, many um, uh, more, bi more buildings, which I think are blocks of flats going up, factories. And, well, I, one thing I did notice was that there were quite few cars in the streets. But the last time we went, there was a gigantic traffic jam. <laughs> so that must say something. <laughs> um, if I may ask you, do you have... Any which way you would encourage uh, people who lives in Russia? You know we have very difficult um, relations right now, East and West. Please don't simplify things. You you can uh, give any kind of advice, but for me personally, it's important. Could you please share your point of view about relations today between yeah, Britain yeah, and, and Russia? Yeah, and which way we should go further? What we should care about mostly? What we should follow? Which way it might be developed? Should we care about opinion in the West or not? Maybe listen to, but uh, go our own way. I, I, I think Russia must go her own way because you can't just be governed by the whims of people. And there's, um, I, I don't defend a, a lot of things that have been done in, the, in recent times, especially um, uh, assassinations, which on the evidence appear to be state directed. But in other, other respects, I think uh, understanding Russian and Russian history is so important and perhaps it should be taught much more widely. For example, people have the most extraordinary, ignorant ideas about Ukraine and Crimea, um, which make my mind boggle that they know so little. And um, if they understood the history of uh, how, for example, uh, Crimea temporarily passed under Ukraine, uh, they think that Ukraine is a country like France or Spain. They don't, I'm not saying anything hostile to Ukraine, but that nevertheless it's a, a country which didn't exist. And it, it temporarily existed in 1918. It wasn't really a country at all under the Soviet Union, just ruled like the rest. And um, after all, Crimea had been Russian since the time of Catherine the Great. My, my grandparents met uh, playing tennis in the Crimea in 1910. Uh, it was a, as Russian as Russian could be. Of course, the Tatars lived there too, 
but uh, and who were horribly persecuted by Stalin. But I think in imperial times, they were um, they they were to lived uh, tolerated and lived well together. So, but anyway, those are details. I think understanding of Russia and and, um, and teaching in more depth is is very very important. I mean, I'm not saying that they. Uh, what Russian policy or British uh, allied British Western European, but well, I think there has been a what I would be critical of the West is a, a rather aggressive policy towards Russia, advancing NATO, which they promised to Gorbachev would not happen, as far as the Baltic states and um, Poland and uh, Romania and so on. Um, that was a big mistake. Russia has been um, threatened and invaded by the West, by the Swedes, by the French, by the Germans, by the English, by the French, uh, um, over and over again. And th this, to any Russian, must appear um, dangerous, not just suspicious. Uh, and of course, but the hostility then means that Russia herself becomes threatening in response. Uh, so, th And this tension, I think, should be, be brought down... Uh, it's not by pretending the problems don't exist, but by uh, doing more to understand them in their historical perspective. And that after all, Russia, despite the ignorance in Western Europe of the fact, Russia is, or the east, west of the Urals, is a European country. And um, relations have always been very close or for the centuries between Russia and the West. And I think Russians, I know when Russians go to Poland, they say we're going to Europe. But uh, on the other hand, in the Urals, there's that obelisk which says Asia and Europe. And since the time of Herodotus, um, I think that in those days they didn't even know the Urals existed, but the Don was the, the fr eastern frontier of Europe. So they should remember that Russia is part of Europe. And, uh, and as, of course, even more importantly than political and cul culturally, uh, Europe would be very poor if if Russia were not considered part of Europe. I suppose my family in, is among those which testify to the contrary. I was going to finish our conversation, but then it's a very difficult subject I touch and you describe. And um, I would suggest to answer you another question and then, then maybe it will be the finish. I'm 100% sure that Russian as a culture, Russian people love foreigners. Sometimes this love might embrace, embrace. embrace too heavy yes, and some, yes. some foreigners might be frightened or uh, feel uh, danger in a way. But I should say this is an honest love. Um, could you please share your mind, uh, your, your first time when you've been to Russia? Of course, you, you're Russian. You, 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 it's, it's not correct to compare your attitude or your impression. Uh, this attitude, yes. it happens f uh, during very short time when you became a friend with a foreigner. Do you think, am I right, that Russians love foreigners or I'm, in, in, uh, I'm not really correct in this way? Yeah, I think they do. And uh, of course, Russian culture has always taken on a lot of, especially from France and then Germany and Britain, of Western European culture. And um, uh, indeed, the, well, the last emperor, he corresponded with his wife always in English and uh, spoke perfect English. And, uh, and I think, and of course, Russia's like Anna Karenina, they go run away and live in Italy. And uh, Russians have always, um, uh, or certainly since the 18th century, loved, loved Western Europe. And but Western Europe, I think, was always suspicious, or tended to be suspicious of Russia and think of Russians as barbarians, but we know, we know we're not. Uh, and we don't have to worry about that. Um, the evidence speaks for itself. And it was, I think it was Solzhenitsyn pointed out that in the Russia uh, Zarubyezhye, uh, that had, if it had been an independent nation, it would have had a higher culture probably than almost any other country in the world at the time. The, the, uh, Rachmaninoff and uh, um, Nabokov and, and so on, the list is endless. Um, so I think, and Russia, but I think most, in my experience, when they know I'm Russian, uh, English people are very curious and sympathetic, and uh, I don't think they share, um, they wouldn't, 
I wouldn't even think probably about whether Crimea should be Russian or Ukrainian, these problems. Um, so I don't think there's, there's in, in, in Britain, there's really hostility to Russia among the public generally. I've certainly never experienced it, except when I was in court. And when the judge suddenly looked at me when I'd been um, making and speaking in evidence, and he said, um, uh, has it ever been a problem with you that because you're Russian, you see things only from the Russian side? And I thought to myself, would you have asked Lord Aldington if he was, had a problem with only seeing things from the English side? No, he would not. So, that, but that's an ignorant and prejudiced judge. That's not my experience among the English people I meet of all sorts. In fact, I remember um, I always walk a lot in the village and I passed, there was a van parked and uh, two people were sitting in the front. And as I came, they back, the doors at the back were open. So I was walking past with my dog and I heard one say to the other, they say that man's a count. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what they thought that meant. <laughs> <laughs> the last, very last question, and unfortunately, um, time is running. Um, it's it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, uh, maybe you know how to answer this question very easily, but I think I would not answer this. Could you please give us three words, characteristic words, what does it mean to be Russian? What does it mean in Russian culture for you? In three words, different kind of word. It might be color, I don't know, um, smell, uh, any kind of characteristic. Um, I think, well, the main characteristic, of course, is the gigantic size of Russia, um, which I think is, is good. When I feel in England now that the countryside is all being destroyed, I feel constricted and as, almost as if we're besieged. But in Russia, when I see these vast open spaces and forests, it suddenly liberates my spirit. But that's, um, but also because I'm, I love Russia and I love Russian history, I feel um, the, the, all this great and good in Russian history coming out. When I think about uh, Russia before the revolution, of course, I don't think it was an ideal state, but at least it was, it had a very high culture. It did seem to be, well, it was. Um, they abolished serfdom, were moving in the direction of becoming a, a, a constitutional monarchy, and then everything destroyed by the Great War and then the revolution. So anyway, um, yeah, yes, I feel, I remember the first time I set foot in, on, in Russian soil, I, I thought I'd feel, I don't know what I thought I'd feel, but I suddenly felt, just felt I'd come home. Because I was used to hearing Russian people talking all around me and um, so, um, but I've forgotten what the other question was. No, 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 just uh, the, you're answering very uh, interesting. Just uh, three characteristics, oh, yes. I don't know, obras, I don't know how, image, to give oh, yes. an image, a verbal image. Well, I, one thing I do like about Russians, which is different from English people, is that Russians are very passionate and they like arguing. And um, and I like arguing. I think it's uh, people in England rather say, you know, you mustn't get too worked up. You mustn't. Um, uh, but I think it's good fun. You have an argument, and um, and then you're still friends, and, and you you just have different opinions. And Russians, I think, I notice like that. And so I suppose I must have inherited that. Sometimes I feel I'm too argumentative. <laughs> then I'm slightly ashamed of myself. I understand. So one characteristic. Well, of course, I, I do love the Orthodox Church mm -hmm. because I, I, that's something, of course, when you go to Russia, that's no different from the church in Zorobyzhia. And so that makes you feel at home. And also, even though I'm, it's an accident of birth, obviously, that I'm Orthodox, nevertheless, to me, it's a truly spiritual religion, which sadly the Church of England on the whole is not. Uh, so that appeals to me, the beauty of the liturgy, the singing and everything about it. And the fact that it doesn't change, because after all, the, the great truths um, don't change. And that's what, after all, religion is all about. Uh, and nobody seems to want change, which says something for the um, beneficial effect of the Russian Orthodox Church. 
and that it's extraordinary how it's survived all those years of persecution. And now it makes me very happy when I go back to Russia to see how strong the position of the church is, even with monasteries and convents opening, new churches being built. Okay, it's a very important um, subject, but we are not going to, to touch it because it's endless. Okay, yes, yes. third characteristic, uh, second characteristic, and please, the last one. I think that any I, kind of um, well, for me personally, it's because of course it is the home of my ancestors and have and I, I not only have an interest generally in history, but of course, especially in well, have a particular interest in my own family's history, which is an interesting one, and I wrote a book about the family some years ago. Uh, so, in a way, that sort of makes me feel rooted in, not just in Russia, and not just in my own family, but in, in Russian history. And I sometimes think if you, my book, I've called it 20, 24 Generations of Russian History, because that's how far we can travel. If you think of 24 people waiting for a bus, they would only go to the end of that room. So the connection is really back through history. Well, it makes me feel a part of history, really um and but we, i mean that applies to every single person obviously everybody is a part of history but I, 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 uh, so when i go there i feel this is in a way where i belong even though i don't actually live there thank you so much thank you so much oh, thank you